Uh, now, this is uh, money is one of those taboo subjects you don't talk about in churches, isn't it? particularly we don't talk about it in this church. I'm, I'm very conscious of the fact that um, it's awkward for someone who is paid by the church in some ways to talk about money. Incredibly awkward uh, about that. In fact, uh, someone made the comment to me at Village Church a little while ago, uh, after they'd been there for six or seven months. They said, you know, I didn't even know that you could give at Village Church. How do you do that? Because I talk about it so little. I never mention it from the front. I said, well, if you just turn your bulletin over in four-point font on the front, if you get a, micro, micro, a uh, magnifying glass, you can see the giving details in the back. That's how little I talk about it, how awkward I feel about it. And yet the reality is that when you look at Jesus' teaching throughout the Gospels, nearly 25% of his teaching, the content of his teaching, is about wealth and money. He sees it as, as such a challenge for us, such a hurdle to overcome, that he needs to spend such a significant time talking about it. And the reality is, for those who have more, the problem is actually greater. There are a number of studies that have been done um, recently that have shown those who have less are far more willing to part with what they have than those who have more. So there was a study done in the UK uh, in 2010-2011 that showed the poorest 20% in the UK, the poorest 20% gave 3.2% to charity, 3.2% of their income to charity. The top 20% in the UK gave just 0.9% of their income. So the richer you are, the less you give. Same study was done in the US in 2007. It showed that the poorest 20% gave 4.3% of their income away to charity. Their annual income was around about $10,500 a year, and they gave away 4.3%. The top 20% in the US, who earn around about an average wage of $160,000 a year, gave away about 2.1% of their income. So somehow, when we have less, we're, we're more willing, or we're less attached to what we have, and so we're more willing to part with it. And yet somehow, when we have more, we're, we're less willing to part with what we have. And that presents a challenge for us here today, because uh, I want to put it to you that we are not living on the poverty line. We are not struggling. Now, I, don't, I say, no, I don't want to minimise the struggle that many people are actually having at the moment, even within this congregation. There are a number of people who've lost their jobs, a number of people who are struggling financially, but as a, a, a general observation, we as a church and as a congregation, I include myself in this, we live well within that top 20% of wealth in Australia, well within that. There was an article that came out this week uh, in The Australian, and so the average income for a household in Australia was about $34,000. That's the average income. The average income for the top 20% of houses is around 58000 That's the average income. Now, I go on a limb and I'd say most of the people who come to Mitchelton, who live in this area, have an average income around that. So I would say we comfortably sit, uh, sit within the top 20% of Australia. And we also live within one of the wealthiest countries in the world. We are wealthy, whether we want to admit it or not. Now, this passage which talks about wealth is a little bit confronting. It's a little bit awkward. But if you're here today and you're not a Christian, uh, can I say, as you look through this passage, here's what you can do with this passage. You can see what the Bible actually says about money and wealth and finances. Not what other people might say, but what the Bible actually says about it. And so next time you hear some guy on the TV or at some church talking about money and asking for your money, you can run it through the grid of 2 Corinthians 8 and 9 and see whether he is actually being faithful to what God says money and wealth is supposed to be uh, understood like. Particularly this uh, verse we're going to see in 2 Corinthians 8 and 9. But for uh, those of you who are here this morning who are Christians, uh, there's going to be a challenge in this passage to rethink the way we understand our wealth and our finances. Now, just have a look with me at this passage, because Paul talks in this passage in 2 Corinthians 8 and 9 about a very specific situation that he is uh, talking about. He, he's talking about this thing which they call the collection. Now, this is not... His understanding of what he's talking about wealth is not the weekly giving to a local church congregation. This is a, a very specific idea called the collection, which is for Jewish Christians... And he's writing to the 
Corinthian Christians, which are in the kind of Mediterranean area. It's, it's in Greece, Corinth. So he's talking about people these people would never have met. And he talks about the collection here in 2 Corinthians 8 and 9. He talks about it in uh, 1 Corinthians 16. He talks about it in Romans 15. He mentions it in Galatians 2. So this was a, a pet hobby. This was a project of Paul. It's sort of like the Christmas appeal that we have every year. You know, we raise money for the orphanage, the bus for the orphanage. Uh, we raised money for Educating 100. We raised money to plant the church in Sendai in Japan. That's the kind of thing that Paul is talking about here when he talks about the collection. Now, for Paul, when he speaks about wealth, as with everything else, he understands it in light of the gospel. Because that colours everything for Paul. And for Paul here, what we see is, as he talks to the Corinthians, he says, the way in which you use your wealth is a litmus test for where your heart is at. It's a litmus test. The Corinthians were actually wealthy compared to their neighbours, the Macedonians at this point. And he says, how you use your wealth is going to indicate where your heart is. So we start to unpack 2 Corinthians here. This is what we're going to see as we do it. We're going to see one motivation, the one motivation, the driving foundation for Christians. We're going to see Paul apply that motivation to four different situations within Corinth. And then we're going to see him give one principle for how it is that Christians should use their wealth. So let me just, one motivation, four applications and one principle. Let me start with the motivation here. It's in verses 1 to 9 in chapter 8. Now, as a, as a parent, there are lots of methods that I, I try to use to get my kids to do what they're supposed to do, or at least do what I want them to do. Uh, you know, I, I threaten, you will clean up your room, otherwise you're going to forget what daylight looks like. Two, coercion. If you clean up your room, you can have this entire packet of soft jube lollies just after I leave for work this morning. Uh, coercion. Embarrassment. If you don't clean up your room, you are going to have no clothes to wear tomorrow. You're going to go to school in your underpants. For comparison, uh, I was around at Caleb's house the other day and his mum said that he cleaned up his room without being asked. Now, I've got to say, yesterday I used every single one of those tactics. I'm not ashamed to say that on my kids. Every single one. Now, at first glance, as you read through this, particularly in these first nine verses, it seems as if Paul's approach to getting the Corinthians to think and consider about how they use their wealth is this embarrassment, comparison angle. He compares them to the Macedonian church. He brings them up as an example. Most likely, he has in mind the church in Philippi. Uh, so we read about the generosity of the Philippians, if you read Philippians 4. Now, see what he says, though, in this passage about this church in Macedonia. Verse 2, he says, Out of extreme trial and poverty... They gave. Yet they did it overflowing with joy. It welled up in rich generosity. In verse 3, he says they didn't give out of their excess. It wasn't just screaming the, screaming the cream off the top. They gave out of their poverty. They gave as, as much as they were able to. In verses 4 and 5, Paul pleads with them for the privilege of supporting not merely the Jerusalem Christians, but Paul himself. The Macedonians pleaded in their poverty to give money away. See, the Macedonians were on the poverty line. And Paul is writing to those in Corinth who have wealth. And he says to the Corinthians, these Macedonians gave out of their poverty and they did it joyfully. Which must leave, or leaves me with the question, why is it that they did that? If they were so poor, the Macedonians, why did they give it away? There's a word that Paul keeps dropping uh, in these verses. In fact, in this whole chapter, this word appears twice as many times as it does anywhere else in the whole book. It's this idea of grace. Paul says, verse 1, you know about the grace. Verse 4, where it's translated in our Bibles, privilege, it's actually the same word, grace. Verse 6, uh, bring to completion this act of grace. Verse 7, at the end, see that you also excel in this grace of giving. And verse 9, that we'll look at in a second. Paul keeps talking about this thing called grace. Paul picks up on this word and he applies it both to the Macedonian situation and also the Corinthians. And he says the Macedonians saw it as a gift, as a privilege, 
to use what they had, as little as it was, for the benefit of the Jewish Christians who were going through a hard time. It was a famine at that point. They were going through persecution as well. We don't exactly know what the situation was, but the Macedonians saw it as a privilege. Now, what drove that? A sense of of altruism, a a warmth that that spread through them when they gave and they thought, I'm helping someone else. And Paul puts his finger on something different. He says their grace was driven by this grace. 2 Corinthians chapter 8, verse 9. For you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich yet for your sakes, he became poor so that you through his poverty might become rich. This is what the cross did for the Macedonians. It told them they were rich beyond compare. And then it helped them to rethink their wealth. So it told them they were rich. What is wealth? But it's it's a means, isn't it, to to security for ourselves and and for our family, for those around us. For some, it's a a means of of comfort. For some, it's it's a means of importance. It's the avenue to get to to a full life. Well, Paul comes along with the gospel and he says, look, those things are tenuous at best. It might work for a while, but it's not going to work for very long. It's, you know, like an elephant sitting on a children's chair. You know at some point it's going to crack, don't you? You know, it's just going to break. It's going to end in disaster. I built a, a... bathroom a few years ago with a guy named Greg Williams who's an elder here and when I say built I watched Greg do it and handed him things Um, because I'm useless to be perfectly honest I'm absolutely useless. Now I learned a lot at one point I remember Greg was using a drill which was the same drill that I had and there was a bit that came not a drill bit but a bit that's my technical term for it a thing that came with the drill uh, that I'd been using in this particular way because it fits in there so it must be must work like that and I saw Greg using it and I realised, actually, oh, I had it all wrong. It was compl- I had completely the wrong use for this thing that came with my drill. And I realised as I was watching Greg, I-, I was doing something which was both stupid and dangerous. And I actually can't believe that's what it was there for. Greg taught me differently. Embarrassing. But incredibly informing. I think when Paul talks about the gospel... And the gospel for him is the ultimate corrective to how we see ourselves and how we see our wealth as well. He says, are you seeking comfort and security? Are you seeking importance? Are you seeking life? You are looking in the wrong place. You're using that tool for the wrong reason. He says, you know, God offers security, eternal. The king offers you to make you his child. He promises to provide for you. He offers life to the full. See, the cross replaces this uncertain and tenuous connection that wealth has with contentment and security and it puts in its place something which is absolutely unmovable. It's God. And then in having replaced it, having replaced that thing that mimics security with the real thing, the cross showed the Macedonians what God used wealth for and how God used wealth. So the cross is the thing that guides how and why Christians use their finances and their wealth in particular ways. And this verse says to us, God spared nothing for us. So how can we do anything less? What motivates Christian to give? Well, it's standing at the foot of the cross and it is seeing that God poured himself out for us that God gave up his comfort and his riches so that we in our spiritual poverty might become rich beyond compare. See, when you stand beside the cross, it is incredibly hard to be selfish with what you have, incredibly hard. The cross is a linchpin for the Christian life, including how we use and we see our wealth. So Paul takes that idea, 2 Corinthians 8 9, And then he applies it to four aspects of the Corinthian situation. Four things that the Corinthians were struggling with and Paul wanted to explain. He says four things. I'm going to race through these so I can get to verses 6 to 15. But let me just say four quick things that he says. The first one is this. He says it's not about the size of how much you give. It's not about how much you do, verses 8 to 8. Uh, chapter 8, 10 to 12. You know, if you've read 1, 2 Corinthians, you'll see, you'll know that Paul has a few problems with the Corinthians. 
There's a few things going on in the church he's not all that impressed with. But the one thing they do seem to have gotten right is that they were incredibly generous in their donation to this collection last year. But this year, Paul says, they're dragging their feet. Whether it's to do with the undermining of Paul's leadership, which he's going to outline more in chapters 10 to 13 in 2 Corinthians. He says, for some reason, you're dragging your feet. And Paul says to them, look, don't worry so much. Don't worry so much how much you give. Verse 12, because if the willingness is there, the gift is acceptable according to what one has, not according to what he does not have. See, what God is actually interested in, not the size of the gift, he is interested in the heart behind it. God doesn't need our money. I'm pretty sure that the creator of all things can provide for himself. God does not need our money. He wants our heart. That's what Paul is saying first. Secondly, this is the second thing Paul is saying. This is not when he calls on the Corinthians to give. This is not about a redistribution of wealth. This is about a redistribution of love. So Paul is not a communist. And all the capitalists in the room will sigh of relief there, you know, because as we've seen, it's not so much about the size of the gift that, that he's going to take to the Jewish Christians. He doesn't need everyone to have the same amount of money. That's not important. Although I'm sure he's hoping to take enough that it will actually alleviate some of their suffering. No, for Paul, it's about what the gift says to the Jewish Christians when he takes it to them. It says from these people they have never met, we are with you in the gospel, in your suffering. We are partners with you because of what Christ has done. And we know that a time might come when we will struggle as well and we know that at that time you will be there for us as well. You see, verse 13, his desire isn't that others are hard-pressed but there might be this equality. So at this point, the Corinthians have plenty but the Jewish Christians do not. And so in some way, each other will supply what the other needs. Now, you look, have a look through church history, and that's exactly how you're going to see things played out. In fact, if we just take where we're at at the moment in the Western world, it would seem like the Western world is the affluent part of the world, that we are the Christian part, and for many years it has been us sending out to others. In 30 years' time, it's approximated that 30% of, the Christian, of people in China will be Christians. One and a half billion population, 30% of that, uh, that's something, that's a figure less than that, isn't it? Uh, it's about 450,000, something like that. I think that's right. No, that's not right, actually. About 375. Anyway, something like, you've got to calculate, you've got smartphones to do this, I don't need to learn that these days, do I? Uh, anyway, it's, it's a figure less than that. That's, I worked it out, I actually did work it out during, the, the number of Christians in 30 years in China will be greater than the population, entire population of the US and the UK and Australia put together. That's phenomenal. So at some point in the future, China is going to be the powerhouse for the gospel. They are going to be the ones supplying what we need. It swings and roundabouts. Paul is saying it's not so much about wealth here, it's about partnership in the gospel. It's about the redistribution of love. Third, 16 to 24, Paul says it's about transparency. One of the things that Paul is going to go on to address at the end of this letter is this critique that is being levelled at him. You can have a look at chapter 11, verse 7 to see it, that he doesn't accept money. Now, you and I would think, well, that's good, isn't it? Church people shouldn't accept money, this kind of thing. But they're critiquing Paul for saying that. It's saying, what kind of teacher is it that does these kind of things for free? Now, his qualifications must be, mustn't be very good. He, he mustn't have very much ability if he doesn't, can't even charge for what he does. So Paul clarifies the situation for the Corinthians. He says to them in verses 16 to 24 that this guy Titus is coming as well as two others in verses 18 and 22 who we don't really know who they are. They might be Luke who might have written the gospel. Uh, they might be Apollos in verse 22 but we don't really know. Who knows? But he says these two other people as well as Titus are coming and they're well known, they're publicly acknowledged, they're trustworthy and they're coming, verse 20, so that, let me read it for you. Because he wants to avoid any criticism of the way that he and those organising this collection administer the gift. Paul wants there to be transparency. Why? Not just because it's a good thing to do, but because he wants there to be no impediment to people hearing the gospel. He's not in this to make a profit. 
He wants to make sure that there is no hint of him personally profiting from the work that he does amongst God's people. Five percent for them, five percent for me. That's not how it works. He wants people to hear the gospel. Even if it means, and you see this again and again, even if it means him going without. Number four. Chapter 9, verses 1 to 5. Sorry, we're racing through this so quickly. The fourth thing Paul says is that at some point, at some point, your wealth needs to be about action and not just talk. At some point, money talks. And Paul's sending Titus and he's sending his friends to Corinthians and he's hoping not to be embarrassed when they get there, when he gets there, in fact. Because for all Paul's issues with them, the one area that Paul is boasting about the Corinthians to others is this area of giving, this area of generosity. So he's sending Titus and his friends at this advance party so they can iron out some of the problems so that when he comes through Corinth with the Macedonians, his boasting doesn't prove empty. What does Paul want them to do in the meantime? He wants them to think about how they're going to use their wealth. He wants them to consider the one who became rich so that they, poor so that they might become rich. And then he wants them to take their faith in God, which they are so proud of, and translate that into action. Not as a gift that's grudgingly given, verse 5, but as a generous gift. It's coming up to uh, tax time very soon. And I love tax time uh, because I usually get something back. I didn't a few years ago. It was very disappointing for me. It was very disillusioning. Anyway, it's a bit, I usually get something back. It's like a gift I'm giving to myself via the ATO. Um, it's very exciting. Uh, but anyway, I understand taxes, and I appreciate taxes. I'm glad that we have them. I reckon they're fundamental to you know, building a healthy and equitable society. I like that. But I've never got to the end of the year. Uh, I've never got my tax return back and thought, you know what? I reckon the ATL are probably doing a little bit hard this year. Uh, I'll just send a little bit more back to them. I'll just give a little bit more to the government. Now, I've never thought that. You know, I might be different. All right, I'm the bad person. You probably have done that, but I've never thought that. You know, who wants to pay more than they have to? Now, often this idea of um, tithing in association with Christianity is how this is all kind of caught up. That is, it's this Old Testament idea that Christians are commanded to give 10% to God. Now, when you get to the New Testament, the New Testament only once ever, only once, ever talks about, talks about tithing. Only once. Matthew 23. And at that point, Jesus is actually critiquing the Pharisees because they use it as a, as a means by which they don't really have to give to God. So they, they, they tithe their spices down to, down to the, you know, these little, you know... I was going to name some spices there, but I don't know any. I eat too much meat. Anyway, you know, they, that's the kind of granularity they get to. But their heart's not in it. They've actually forgot the intent behind the, the tithing. That's the only time it's spoken about, Matthew 23. When Paul talks to those who live on this side of the cross, this side of the God who gave himself for us, and he gives a guideline for how we use our wealth, He does not mention tithing, not at any point. This is what he says, verses 6 to 15, in this whole passage. This is what he says. He says, be generous. Be generous. Just see, verse 7, what he says to the Corinthians in these remaining verses. He says, each man should give what he has decided in his heart to give, not reluctantly or under compulsion, because God loves a cheerful giver. You should give what you've decided to give. Not because it's some arbitrary figure or or percentage, no, no, but because it's a reflection of the one who became poor so that we might become rich. Verses 8 to 11. He says, you know, your understanding of your wealth should be that it comes from God, that God can and does gift us with different gifts so that we can serve others. It's not some sort of tit-for-tat arrangement with God where, you know, I will give you this much and I expect this much in return. No, no. It's just in a way that demonstrates that our hope is not in our wealth, but in God, so that we can be a blessing to others. In verse 12 to 13, see where he finishes. 
He says this service that you perform, it's, it's not only supplying the needs of God's people, it's also overflowing in many expression of thanks to God because the service by which you have proved yourselves, men will praise God for the obedience that accompanies the, your confession of the gospel of Christ and for your generosity in sharing with them and with everyone else. You see what Paul is saying? You see the picture he's building up? Paul talks to Christians, and when he, he talks to the Corinthian Christians about their wealth, he doesn't say, this is what you should do. Let me lay down the law for you. You need to give 2%. You need to give 5%. You need to give 10%, just like they did in the Old Testament. That's not what he says. What he says, and this is revolutionary, particularly for those with a Jewish background. He says, when you look at what God has given you, when you consider the God who gave up everything so that he could buy you back, the only genuine response in every part of your life, including your wealth, is generosity. It's the only appropriate response. No boundaries to it. My parents live in Sydney and they often come up to visit. It's not to see me, I know that. It's to see, see the boys, I understand that. Um, I, but look, it would be strange though when they came up, my parents who are generous, godly people, it would be strange though when they came up if I billed them for the nights that they stayed. Now, you stayed for two nights this time, so that's two nights accommodation. There were six meals included in that. Uh, you had some things from the minibar I put in your room, uh, so we'll, uh, I'll, just double, I'll charge you double for that, actually. There's a little bit extra for the pleasure of my company and my progeny. Uh, so I've got to charge them. It would be ridiculous, wouldn't it? What a strange arrangement would be. There is no price I could put on how much my parents have done for me. No price. I could never repay it. Those small generosities that I might show to them when they come up, you know, it's, it's, it's a drop in an ocean. Let me put to you how much more with the gospel if we're Christians? How much more with the gospel? If you're a Christian, how is it that the gospel affects your use of wealth? What drives what God has given you? Is it, is it guilt? Is that why we give? Guilt that we know we're supposed to give and other people might be watching when that plate comes round. I have to do it. Is it obligation that you know somehow God expects you to give and he's watching over your shoulder each week to see how many coffees you buy, how much you spend on yourself and how much you spend on him? Is that why we do it? Is it law that you feel bound to some percentage figure and then either, in that, you either feel guilty because you never get there and you know you should, or you feel proud because you do get there. Or have you understood, as I think Paul is pushing us to, God's love and his example so deeply that you have been freed so that there are no boundaries to your generosity, just as there weren't with God's. 2 Corinthians chapter 8, verse 9. You know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, yet for your sakes he became poor, so that you through his poverty might become rich. Let me pray. Father, we can only begin to comprehend the amount that you gave up in being the creator and the king of all things to come to this earth to save those who did not want to know you who had been pushing you away. And not just to save us, Father, but to make us rich. Father, we pray that as we understand the things that you have given us, the gifts we have, uh, including the wealth that we have, Father, we thank you for these things, and yet we pray that we would not use them to serve ourselves, but that we would use them to serve you. That in some small way, people might see the way we use our money, and give glory to you. Amen.